Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, this is Muslima of the West, Glory. And today I have a guest, another sister who's out in Texas. Her name is Ruba. And we're just going to chat with each other and talk about stories about Islam and a little bit about what it's like to live in Texas as a modern Muslim woman versus living in the North. That's right. So, uh, Ruba, uh, do you have anything that you want to ask me to start out with? Any topics? Okay, so uh, I am also a YouTuber like you, so I have a lot of questions that I want to ask, but I don't want to be saving over you. So I'm going to make you do all the questions and maybe okay. at the end I will do my interview with you because I really, I'm really like interested to know more about you as a person telling me about your story of Islam. And uh, I saw you also selling like some merchandise and and things like that. So I'm really interested in that. And thank you so much for your gift that you have sent me, which is, uh, it was a really nice abaya, uh, you know, and uh, I'm sure that I, I can put it in use for some of the sisters, uh, for my sister closet, inshallah. So Jazakallah khair, may Allah bless you. Oh, you're very, very welcome. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. I just have a small shop that I opened up a few months ago. So basically I just have the classic, basic abayas and hijabs that women need you know usually if they're reverting i don't have anything fancy on there for parties or anything like that just kind of the the basic ones that everyone needs to have especially in the beginning that's, that's great yeah mm -hmm. uh, that's really awesome yeah so uh tell me a little bit about you sister muslima like how long have you been muslim i've been muslim since 2016 uh, so a few years, and uh, before that I was Christian, and uh, my family is actually a mix of kind of agnostic, Christian. I do honestly have one other Muslim in my family, and she had married into the family. I'm not sure how that worked because... I don't know that her husband um, reverted to Islam. I, I met him and he didn't appear to be a Muslim, but I guess I didn't um, approach him with that question either. So he must have, yeah. he must have, or she wouldn't have been able to marry him. But um, I only met her once and it was at a family reunion a few years back and I had just reverted. I had been a new Muslim for one year. Mm. And um, really, I have always been close to God and interested in uh, scriptures. And my family being kind of split up that way, I was kind of back and forth between being able to access religious activities and talk about religion uh, versus not. And uh, I always felt that I was just a little bit different from the rest of the family, not just in the way of religion, but in the way of how I felt about how a family should be structured and just a few other things. Like, like I always felt like I wanted more of a community, more of a village type setting, more of um, togetherness. And I didn't know anything about Islam. Um, but when I found out, I realized that it felt more like home to me. And I had had a few experiences where I met Muslims in the past, in my life. And I also had a few experiences where I attempted to read the Quran. Um, but I didn't really get a good understanding until much later. And it was then that I decided to do research on Islam to see if that was really the path I wanted to go on. So I listened to many lectures and studied a lot and was reading the Quran and talking to people and I ended up going to mosque by myself. Yes. And the sisters they were very nice. I'm scared of going to the mosque by themselves. So how did you how did that like how tell us a little bit about your experience was it scary like what did you meet a lot of people how, how was that i was nervous 
because I was worried that I might go in the wrong section because I knew there was a men's entrance and I wasn't sure how to get to the women's section. And there was really nobody around. It was a small mosque uh, in Olympia, Washington. Washington, oh, I was gonna mm -hmm. ask you, okay, yeah, awesome. Yeah. I made it up there and it was pretty obvious to them that I didn't know what I was doing because <laughs> I just kind of walked in, put my shoes outside the door and started praying with them. I just was following them. I didn't know what they were saying. And after the prayer, they all kind of came up to me and welcomed me and kind of took it from there. So, you know, it's awesome that we went to a small mas masjid because, uh, you know, from my experience uh, being in different states, not only in, United, in Texas, but I also was in Alabama last year. And then I'm here in Texas just temporarily. Uh, I live right now in Virginia. And uh, most of the, the, the large masajid you will see people uh, are cold maybe because there are so many people. So they wouldn't know who's new and who's not. And they barely say salam alaikum to you or anything like that. But small masajid, because they're like a family-oriented kind of masjid, so everybody would know everybody. And anybody comes new, uh, they would, like, uh, treat them differently and, you know, welcome them and, you know, be more hospitable with them. So, yeah, so I'm glad that you did that. You did that. You did go to a smaller masjid, uh, because usually if you're going with a larger masjid, it's better, like, I always, like, tell my friends, like, take somebody with you who knows the place inside and that they can show you around and things like this. But yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you're from the West. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so sorry about that. Uh, before we go to that subject, mm -hmm. uh, what happened after that? Like after you went to the masjid and you prayed, you weren't a Muslim at that time yet, were you? Did you do? Take no, I wasn't Muslim yet. Uh, <laughs> Completely dressed inappropriately, too. I could have really oh, used yeah. the gift of Maya at that time. I can imagine as a new, yeah, sure. Okay, so what happened after that? Uh, well, one of the sisters kind of took me under her wing. Her name was Rakaya, and she was there for me. She was just there for me. I could call her anytime. She invited me to things. She kept me updated on what was happening in the community. And that honestly really helped me. If I didn't have that, I think I would have felt so alone and kind of lost, you know. Um, and so I actually did a video on that on my channel talking about how important that was to me and how important I think it is, you know, when reverts come to mosques to be able to have some kind of mentorship. Because when you're a revert, oftentimes it is a very lonely path because most times families are not either religious or they're against mm. leaving their religion than going to another one, right? So even That's though my family is um, kind of broken up between agnostic and Christian, and in a way they're kind of accepting, but in another way they're not. So I get little, little tidbits of kind of mockery or... Uh, feelings of being upset because I've changed and my appearance is kind of different. So it's not comfortable for them a lot of times to see me with my hair covered all the time, um, unless I'm indoors, you know, if I'm indoors with them in my home, then I don't. But um, I think that's, there's some, just some unique things about re being a revert that are difficult is just really kind of nice to have a community and have some mentorship to be able to get through that and not be so alone, you know. Yeah. Now about the mentorship, I would like to also tell the people that um, uh, last year and uh, like in the beginning of this year also, I was working with a group uh, that we have. We I have over like four hundred mentors from all over the world that they uh, they are knowledgeable and they are qualified to teach new muslims so if anyone is interested in the mentorship program uh, right now i don't work with them but um like there are some other people took in 
took the charge because I'm just like so busy in other Dawa stuff. But I was one of the founders with another sister who is also a convert for over 10, 15 years. And she's been an advocate with the new Muslims. May Allah bless her sister, Shannon. And so, uh, uh, yeah, we, we did that mentorship program. And so anyone would like to help to know more about Islam, to learn how to pray, uh, you know, if they have any questions. They Also, if they just ha- want some friends, you know, um, uh, we we offer this mentorship, uh, of course, like with the same sex, so men with men and women with women, so we don't have that mixing between men and women. And uh, uh, the people that I know that they are mentors, they're qualified, they are good people, they are very nice, um, and they, they follow the mainstream Islam, which is the Sunnah. And so, um, yeah, uh, that's that's really great, mashallah. Uh, so, uh, you said you've been three years Muslim. So, tell me a little bit, a little bit about your process in learning more about Islam and learning the prayers and things like that. Was it hard? Was it easy? What steps did you take uh, towards uh, learning more about Islam? Um, well, in the beginning, I took about three and a half to four months to just really make sure it was the right path for me. So what I did in the beginning was I watched just an absolute ton of YouTube videos. (laughs) Lots of lectures by Mufti Mank, um, Mr. Khan, I think his name is Newman Khan. Um, I watched um, Dr. Zakil, I think his name is. Do you recognize that name, Dr. Zakil? He's in it. I um, Indian imam. He t- he answers questions and things like that to really big audiences, and he's memorized. The- oh, Zakir Naik. Okay, Zakir. Zakir Naik. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Got the name wrong. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I watched a lot of theirs, and I watched other uh, Muslimas or new Muslims, and I had to really watch actually quite a few hijab tutorials because it took me a while to learn how to put on my hijab properly. I understand. Still today, I'm wondering sometimes, I don't do a very good job, but. <laughs> well, you know, as long as it covers, it's fine, you know. Yeah. Doesn't matter this time, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That yeah. was the beginning. Um, and then I just tried to go to mosque and join the community as much as possible. Um, but because I was working full time, I wasn't always able to. I was uh, working a government job and working also private practice, um, and I was going to school at the same time. And all of those were killing yourself <laughs> that for a very long time. And but now I'm not. I'm just doing my own thing now, you know. And it's nice. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah. That's um, cool. So I just. That's pretty much it. I just try to spend time with the community. I try to be, you know, at mosque when I could. Um, I try to study as much as I could. I'm I'm not the best at memorization in foreign languages, so I still kind of struggle with that. Um, so it took me actually a very long time to memorize um, the Salah in Arabic. And even after I memorized it, I had a difficult time being able to kind of connect with um, the words I was saying because they weren't really registering with my own language with me very well. So when I was going through the prayers, I was trying to um, kind of focus on my feeling of gratefulness to Allah while I spoke the words because I I really kind of struggled with that, you know, so. MashaAllah. So as a YouTuber and that you're doing uh, your thing, uh, inshallah, I will put also the link of your YouTube channel so people can follow you. Um, When did you start that? When did I start Salah? No, uh, I'm sorry, about the YouTube, like, when did you start? YouTube uh, channel like, uh, a year ago I think yeah. it was a year ago. well maybe it was a little over a year ago it might have been a year and a half 
that's awesome so uh you know being a youtuber um i'm a youtuber too have you have you uh faced any challenges with some muslims in like with with the comments trying to contact you privately things like that mm -hmm. yeah i do have some of that but um alhamdulillah not not very much so i do have some people who will look at my videos and they'll be very proud of me and they'll give me a lot of compliments and they'll encourage me to move forward and learn more and share more uh, but then on the flip side of that, I have a small percentage of people who kind of judge me and are critical or, you know, might make me feel a little bit bad because, you know, I'm still connected to my own genetics and my own culture because I've lived my own, you know, American life for so long. So there's still, I can't just shed all of that and you don't have to by the way because islam does not delete any cultures you know you're supposed to be a proud muslim uh, american you know that you you know that you do whatever the americans do the only thing that is different is your faith towards you know things and about you know your connection to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's what is really important because that's a lot that's one of the problems that we face in the west is any new muslims comes uh, and or any any non-muslim become muslim the first thing they want to do is they want to delete their culture they want to delete their identity and that's wrong and and that's why a lot of new muslims that they came they leave islam and go back to their old life because it's like they feel that it's not me anymore. I don't like myself anymore because I don't want to be a cultural like Muslim or anything, especially the ones that they marry right away after Islam and after they become Muslim. And uh, a lot of men that they try to manipulate their new their wives who are new Muslims who don't know anything about the religion by um, trying to bend them to make them cultural more than uh, being a real Muslim, because even the men, they don't know any better, right? They, they were raised in the culture, but they really don't know the true Islam. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any experience in that. Would you like me? Would you like to talk about it or, you know, or uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, I have just really kind of come to accept the, the fact that I am going to get some criticism for just being who I am because uh, there are a lot of people that are watching me from different areas of the world and a lot of times they haven't even been to America so they don't really understand why is she talking like that or why is she walking like that there's a little too much sway in her step or the or she's not wearing gloves today, or I'll get something like, you don't have to cover your face in Islam. Why are you doing that? And things like that. Well, I just kind of say, well, I cover my face because it's a choice. Um, I like to have my privacy and I don't feel comfortable really with the facial recognition and all of that. And I just feel more private and comfortable. And I do feel like it's kind of part of my hijab, you know, and I wear my hijab. And I think they're beautiful. I love hijabs. Um, and I'm proud of you the way you are. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so do you have also some, uh, I want to go a little bit more into the ugly side of the social media. Uh, do you have any guys that they try to um, like talk to you privately and things? Because I have this problem with many of the new Muslims. And uh, I would like to tackle this a little bit like, about those guys that they try to come in uh, in private and they try to talk mm -hmm. to you out like you know uh, as a they want you to, they want to marry you or anything like that i don't know anything about your personal life so i wouldn't know if you're married or not or anything like that but many guys they try to like you know to hunt for these muslim sisters mm -hmm. uh, online especially the ones in the west for a green card or you know they want to try a new thing you know a beautiful white woman she's actually talking on the camera oh my gosh i'm in love with her from the same from the first sight so how how do you deal with people like this and do you have any experiences with people like that uh yes actually i have quite a bit of that 
it's because I am a Muslim woman online and I think that isn't quite so popular still, even though in today's era we don't have and maybe it's because I'm more comfortable with being online because of my culture and where I am versus if I would have grown up in a strict Muslim family. And I'm sure that has something to do with it. But I also had a story to tell. I also felt like I had a voice and wanted people to hear about my story and me and my life and kind of bring, you know, attention to Islam and, and help people not be afraid of Islam or um, kind of feel like they couldn't approach it because they didn't know enough about it uh, if they were non-Muslim. And yeah, I do have that. I have quite a few people um, constantly, actually. <laughs> um, many times a week ask me, are you married? I love you. Will you marry me? I'm offering you marriage. I just try to be very, very brief and polite uh, and then leave it at that. And then I don't uh, talk after that. And unless it's a, a very young person asking me some questions about Islam or something like that, then I like to be able to encourage them to go to whyislam.org is one of my favorite places to get information. Um, but I have had some people who are kind of persistent and then I have to restrict them so I don't see their messages anymore, or I'll have to block them. Um, I don't know that they know that they're blocked on some of my platforms, um, but I don't interact um, back and forth like that with any of them. And Which for you, which for you, yeah. And I think, you know, they all kind of know that they're, that they really shouldn't be doing that. And Exactly, they don't know, no. Uh, many of them are very ignorant and many of them they actually do that in purpose because they really their aim is not really about Islam their aim is different like worldly things like green card marriage things like this you know and uh, those people I'm sorry to say that but they make me sick to the stomach to the stomach so um, I'm sorry that you're going through this and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you from all these uh, you know uh, people that they try to uh, manipulate the women like that and uh, I mean it's social media so you, you will find always good and bad in everything right mm -hmm. uh, mashallah that's great so um, um, I'm not really sure uh, if you would like to talk a little bit about your community in uh, you said you're in North Dakota right I'm in North Dakota right now we have an extremely small community okay. <laughs> yeah uh, our mosque is teeny tiny and we have about, I want to say, maybe 30 people total in the community out here. And so I have a couple of sisters that I'm able to talk with and sometimes meet with. We try to have Quran classes on Sundays, but it kind of fell through and didn't work out. So that's unfortunate. I think I'm going to see if I can find something online, some type of... Uh, Quran study group online, but I haven't looked in that area yet. Maybe you can um, point me in that direction if sure, you want. Yeah. So you were in Washington and you moved to North Dakota. Why North Dakota? Well, I actually have some land out here okay. and I had intended to sell it. I ended up selling half of it, but now I've decided to keep the other half because one of the other reasons I came out here was the coronavirus had um, really kind of upset things in the Washington area. About. So you're just new in North Dakota, okay. Yeah, well I had been out here much, much uh, longer time ago. That's when I purchased some land out here. Okay. I had just left it alone um, and I was in Washington. So, I'm still kind of trying to figure out where to go at this point because of the whole coronavirus thing. But um, right now I just am kind of sitting put because I'm safe and comfortable and we don't have a lot of corona out here in North Dakota. Yeah, well, it's a small, yeah. Yeah, yeah so Population. I was worried about it and it was, yeah, pretty. Yeah. 
it's a small uh, it's a small population too so uh, about the muslims do they have any kind of uh, like uh, uh, um, circle of knowledge like lectures or anything like that they do in the mosque uh, like how is it like i understand now because of the coronavirus most of the mosques are very slow in um, um, giving lectures and doing activities mm -hmm. so how are you coping in a small community of on of muslims in north dakota and um, mm -hmm. how do you connect with each other guys do you still go to the masjid on fridays well, I've been to the masjid a few times, but uh, we weren't open for quite a while. Right. And not many people are going, but we do have a WhatsApp sisters group. Okay. And we have a WhatsApp Islamic center group. So people can post little things on there awesome. um, and kind of share whatever it is that they want to share. Um, for example, we have a new halal restaurant with small grocery store that opened up in town. And so everyone was able to find out about that through the WhatsApp group. Awesome. But uh, other than that, it has been, you know, kind of quiet, <laughs> I guess would say the word. Yeah. Quiet. <laughs> yeah. How is it in Texas? What is it like for you out there? So before I came come to Texas here, I've been, well, I lived, first of all, I lived in Texas for 17 years. I became Muslim in Texas uh, 15 years ago. And uh, we have what we call mega masjids. Like we have masjids that they have over than three, 4,000 people uh, that they are members. Uh, we have masjid that they do two khutbas uh, on Fridays, two ceremonies, and sometimes three ceremonies in one day because it's just like a lot of people come and so um here's the thing about the big massage in uh, in the west especially here in texas that um, um it takes time to do any kind of dawa work and it needs a lot of uh patience and a lot of um, politics let's say because uh, the mosques are um uh, like I are, are like supervised by uh, board of directors, board of trustees. Mm -hmm. And so the Imam does not really have a big authority in doing things in the mosque. It's not like a small masjid where the Imam can just like decide for what he wants to do in the masjid. No, everything has to go through board of directors. You have to have any, you know, uh, fill out paperwork, make some, um, uh, like uh, take some permission from them to do any kind of dawa work in the masjid, like for example, make a tour or like even uh, do halaqa like lectures or anything like this. So they already, most of the mosques over here are already set up to have like lectures for sisters and they have like the, the lessons that they do in the morning after Fajr by, by the imam. Sometimes they do also like weekend uh, fundraisings and like some kind of special e events. But mm -hmm. most of it is like only bound to the members of that mosque. You see what I'm saying? Like they don't allow somebody from outside. It's just like popping up and say, hey, I want to do something over here. And they don't do it. Like, for example, I, I've been doing the sister closet thing back when I was in Alabama and in in Virginia and it was very successful because the mosques over there are very cooperative with me that they make announcement every week weekend or every Friday for anybody who would like to donate any clothes for sisters uh, like abayas hijabs uh, shawal kamis things like that right but here in Texas it's like if I want to go and talk to anybody I have to apply for it and get a form and write down what I really want to do and they will investigate with me before they make any kind of approval does that make sense and so that's why we have now um, for like charities and things like that we have organizations now that they are specialized to uh, collect uh, donations and charities for people that they are in need. So we have, uh, for example, here, Texas Women uh, Association, Those uh, this organization helped the, the women that they were abused 
by their husbands and they offer shelters for them and food and, and everything. We have another organization is called United Ummah for Refugees, for refugees that help the, uh, the newcomer refugees um, to settle down and, uh, you know, teach them ESL. And also, like, you know, they offer classes to teach the kids and the parents, like, some Quran. And, you know, so they, they don't feel that they are um, um, westernized, let's say. You see what I'm saying? It's like they want to keep protecting them from, uh, you know, protect their religion by teaching them more about Islam and things like that. We have also some other, uh, you know, charity organizations that help the, you know, the New Muslims, we have some of them that they help also um, uh, the the poor families and things like that. And also in the masjid themselves, they also have a department uh, other than the outreach department to help those people who are in need uh, that they take it from the zakah money from the people who actually pay their zakah or their obligatory charity every year. And they call it Baytul Mal means the house of the wealth uh, to help those women and men uh, that, that they are in need. But again, for those men and women that they are in need, they have to go and apply for it and they have to do things like this. So it, it got a little complicated for me to do anything here in Texas with any organization because that I have, as I said, to go through some kind of political things and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But when I was in Alabama, this is uh, how my idea started with uh, um, with a sister closet thing is um, uh, there was a, a small masjid that they collected a lot of clothes and they have like a small room that they actually stacked all these clothes in that room and it's been there for like three years and no one actually looked at those clothes and I was like hey can I go and look and they say yeah sure go for it so it took me a whole day me and my friend and her daughters to sort all the things uh, and all the clothes. So we found a lot of nice abayas and hijabs that really like very excellent condition that people can use. And we have, of course, other clothes like for men and for children that they probably don't need those, right? So we took those ones that they don't need it to the uh, Salvation Army and to the thrift store and we donated them over there. But we kept the Islamic clothes and I have a van um, a big van and then I put all these clothes in the van and then I went to the masjid and uh, there was like a gathering for the new Muslims and I said hey we have some clothes if you want to come and uh, look at them and uh, it was like an ice cream truck standing <laughs> outside of the masjid that they come and they just look at the clothes it was so funny and uh, they just came and they took most of it and uh, I mean I, I tell you, it was a lot of clothes and I was like so happy that I felt so good because really uh, new Muslims, um, many of them, they come from broken homes. Some, many of them, they are single moms, you know, that they really need some help. Right. And uh, and to buy clothes online, like if you want to get a abaya, at least you have to pay 30, 40 dollars, maybe 60 dollars with the shipping and everything to bring it over to the house. and. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I really appreciate, I looked at your store and I really appreciate the prices that you have over there, that they're really nice, good prices that people can afford, right? But if you want to go to other stores, I don't want to say names, they are really expensive, right? And uh, so I, I helped those sisters and I, I started collecting clothes. And then I went to Virginia and in Virginia, they have uh, a big masjid, but they have, but where I... It was like 30 minutes away from me, but there is another like two masjids that they are close close to me. They are not really masjids; they are musalla. That means they only open like once a day, uh, once a week, and and sometimes they open the other days, but they're like very small and not a lot of people go there. And so, uh, I found that uh, one of those masjid is in a very poor area, like very very poor area and uh, they really need some help they even like they can barely even like pay for their bills uh you know and so uh i went to the big masjid and uh, the big masjid was awesome the islamic center of virginia may allah bless them they were very helpful with me they were very nice and uh, you know i just put uh, an you know uh, an application there and i said hey listen 
we really need help to this masjid uh, that they're really in need and most of them are converts most of them are reverts and they really need help and um, we, within even without even thinking uh, we got like a big bucket and we write we wrote on it sister closet and anybody would like to then donate any clothes shoes anything like that people were like bringing clothes like crazy uh, very nice uh, nice abayas nice uh, you know pakistani clothes and, and things like that and uh, i could fill my van again and take it to the other masjid and give away a lot of clothes and and i i remember it was uh, eight time last uh, it was Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha. No, I think it was Eid al-Adha. Uh, Eid al-Adha when uh, people uh, donated. I don't know who was that. I think it was a, a place like a store or something that they have brand new uh, Pakistani clothes that they brought it to the masjid and they filled out the whole bucket plus like a lot of like five other big boxes like those moving boxes of clothes. And we put them in the... Um, in the van and i have a video for it uh, and i took it to the other masjid and uh, mashallah mashallah a lot of people came and took a lot of clothes i even like could donate for other non-muslims too that they came over just to look at the clothes and they were so beautiful it was a great eid that people could celebrate the eid with new uh, with new clothes and so i i love the idea i i love to do it again but right now in texas i only have some uh old clothes for me that they are in a very good condition they're like five and six x large because i shrank a lot you know i lost a lot of weight and so i'm giving those away to the new sisters if anyone is um, big size and would like to donate would like to have some clothes so they can come and uh, and pick them up or i can ship them to them if they are not in texas uh, also, for any other people that they would like to donate clothes for me, I can send you my address and you can send them to me as well, inshallah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, that's what I've been doing. Um, in Texas here, um, we don't have a lot of connection between Muslims like one-on-one -on -one because most of the Muslims over here are so busy in their lives mm -hmm. uh, and they have their own families, they have their own business. And so many of the reverts here in the big cities that they feel that the Muslims are so cold, that the Muslims don't care about them, that the Muslims, uh, they're just separated from each other, you know, and uh, uh, and it's a, it's a problem, especially here in the big cities. Smaller city, probably they would feel much uh, like smaller message that I'm talking about, that they probably feel that it's more a family uh, with this, with less people because people know each other they can come and talk to each other and things like that and so they feel that oh we're the only muslims here we we have to take care of each other but in big cities like in dallas over here you know they they have already their families they already have their muslim neighbors and things like that so they really wouldn't feel the urge to help other muslims who are in need or muslims that they need to company or anything like that so I'm sorry, I, I don't want to feel like, I don't want you to feel like I'm a complainer, but it's just a whole totally different, different environment and atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Like I lived in Alabama, I lived in Virginia. I lived in Alabama for a year. I, I, it's been also a year in Virginia and I, I saw the difference. And I thought that Texas is like any other state that all the other states are like this, but it's not, no, I, f mm -hmm. I found out that it is not like this. It's actually, the bigger the masjid is, uh, the colder it become, uh, like as Muslims uh, together. And not only that is, um, it becomes harder to do things in the mosque, you know what I mean? Especially in Dawa and things like that. I, I don't blame them because we have a lot of people here that you don't know who is who can be trusted or not, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know if they are really on the right doctrine of Islam or they're coming over here to teach things that it is not related to their true Islam. You see what I'm saying? Like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't blame them. I, I really don't. But at the same time, I, I wish that there is an easier way to get to those people who are really in need and that they need help mm -hmm. and that they need support. You mm -hmm. see Especially the new Muslims. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think you have to be pretty strong as a new Muslim sometimes. I mean, I feel like I do because 
you know, like you said, um, a lot of people that are, you know, born into Muslim homes, they have large supportive families and they've just always been Muslim. So they know exactly what to do. And they, they're just, they've got this network already uh, and they don't need another person in there. They're fine. And so when that new lonely little Muslim comes and says, hi, everyone. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, as a new Muslim, uh, I'm, a, I'm a revert too. I reverted 15 years ago, although I am Arab and I speak Arabic. But um, for the whole 15 years, I felt like I'm an outsider all the time. Uh, first of all, like the new Muslims don't see me as a new Muslim because I speak Arabic. So they think that I am like mm-hmm. one of those Arab people, cultural person. And when I come to the Arab people, they look at me as a new Muslim. You see what I'm saying? That I am mm-hmm. different than them. And it's true because I was raised differently. I was raised in a church, you know, that uh, I, I was raised around uh, Christmas trees and Easter bunnies. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like that. So <laughs> um, uh, so I always felt as an outsider. So I totally understand and I totally feel and sympathize with those new Muslims and the reverts that they feel the same way like Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Can you tell me a little bit about your story on why you reverted? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, it's a long story. I have said it so many times on YouTube, and, uh, and even like big shows, like you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, guided by the Quran, things like that. But uh, I, you know, in 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 brief, when somebody asked me like, what brought you to Islam? The only thing I tell them that the Bible actually pointed me to Islam. Because really, I mean, I was a church um, leader and uh, my father is a pa- was a pastor. Uh, I lived literally on the second floor of the church. So the church was the first floor. We were actually on the second floor. I could, mm-hmm. at night time when they have meetings downstairs, I could hear the hymns and the songs that they sing and the lectures that they do like the, on the pulpits and things like that. I also mm-hmm. helped with the... Uh, Sunday school and I was like a leader in the youth community and so uh, I did a lot of things I also studied theology in one of the seminars and so in seminaries I'm sorry um, so uh, when I came here to United States in 2002 I kind of have this cultural shock to see uh, people from all different backgrounds different religions uh, when I was in Jordan, I heard about the Buddhism and Hinduism, but I thought that was an extinct uh, culture or an extinct religion that people don't believe in it anymore. And I thought that it's only Christians and Islam because that's all what I saw in my in my community, right? Mm-hmm. In Jordan, they're only like Muslims or Christians. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I came over here, it was totally different. And I was like, I'm a very curious person. I love to go and try and things like this. I was a born again Christian. So at the same time, it's like I didn't want to leave my, my me, you know, leave my Christianity. But I wanted to see what other people believe in. And Islam was the last thing I would think about. I was like, hey, I lived with the Muslims. I was in Muslim school. So I'm like, why would I go back to and, you know, learn about Islam? So I started, started list, I, um, I learned more about Hinduism. I didn't like it. Uh, I went to Buddhism. It was awesome. Uh, but I was like, hey, I can't be just a Christian Buddhist, you know. It's like, you know, whatever they teach in Buddhism, I can't be a Christian too. I went to Sikhism, and I think Sikhism was the closest one to me at that time because a lot of things that I loved about their teachings and things like that, mm-hmm. uh, about the oneness of God and, uh, you know, about the hymns that they do, about uh, about their cult- uh, historical stories and things like that. I was really amazed by them. But their Gurdwara, which is the temple that they had, it was like at the end of the street. And then on the other side of the street, there is also a mosque. But I never thought about like going to that mosque until later on when I met with some Muslim friends in the college and we started talking about uh, about religion. And I wanted them to come to my church and become Christians. And they wanted me to go to, Islam, to the mosque and become a Muslim. Mm-hmm. And uh, the debate started and it just went on and on for a few months. And then until my mom was coming back to sh- from Jordan to United States and I'm like, OK, my mom's coming. My mom is, uh, you know, she would not like me hanging around with Muslims. So I have to cut it off. 
But at the same time, after I cut it off, I was always thinking myself that there is something wrong. And there are some questions that they asked me that I couldn't answer. Yes, my brain is programmed to answer them on the Trinity, on Jesus is God and things like that, the way that they taught me in the church. But inside me, there is something not right. There is something that I, uh, uh, there is something missing, you know. There is something missing. I, I didn't know. I you know I didn't know what is it, but I was like, you know what? I'm gonna read the Bible, and I'm gonna see what Jesus actually say about himself. Does he really say that he's God? And I did. I I went through Matthew, Mark, John, uh, Matthew, Luke. Uh, I'm sorry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and mm-hmm. till I I got to John, and I was I was like really scared that John is about to be ended. And Jesus did not say that he's God yet. You know, uh, mm-hmm. all these sayings can be interpreted in a different way. Like instead of saying that Jesus is God, we can say that, no, he said about himself that he's a man and all that. And um, if Jesus was praying, who was he praying for if he if he was, you know, God and things like this? Until finally it was John 17, 3, that it really hit me and knocked me off when it says, when, when Jesus said that, uh, this is the eternal life, the eternal life heaven is to know you, the Father, God, as you are only the only one God and Jesus Christ, uh, and Jesus Christ that you have sent. So uh, he's saying that there is only one God and Jesus is sent from God, that he's a messenger from God. So it's very much like he's saying, La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah. Mm-hmm. And Jesus is the messenger of God, you know, and uh, that really hit me and i started like forming my own religion saying okay i'm a christian i'm a jesus follower but uh i just want to be like believing only one god and that jesus is only a prophet of god i don't want to be believing that he's that he's the son of god or he's god so uh this is where i started to really look for other things and um I was like, you know what? Those Muslims are not going to beat me. I'm going to go ahead and read the Quran. And I'm going to try to find mistakes in the Quran. And I'm going to come and show them right in front of them and tell them, hey, look, you have mistakes in the Quran. And uh, I started reading the Quran for the first time in my life. I had Muslim friends all my life, but I never really bothered to open the Quran and read it. I have Muslim friends that they tried to convert, convert me to Islam, but I really wasn't interested until finally I wanted to read that Quran. And I was I was shocked on how many accounts the Quran speaks about Jesus in a good way and in the way that I really believe in, just like he said about himself that he is the messenger of God, that he is the, uh, the servant of God. And uh, all that really like started to, I started to lean more towards Islam. And um, I, uh, every time I, I try to abandon the Quran, something just like bringing me back to it. And I want to read more about it. I even like, I didn't have a Quran in the house. And of course, like my mom wouldn't allow it. And uh, our family are very cultural, you know, hard headed. Uh, hot blood people that they wouldn't like they would get really angry and even abusive physically Mm -hmm. and emotionally if i go against the family i was disowned by the family i was physically abused Mm -hmm. Uh, i was really tortured even verbally by them playing the guilt game on me all the time so i went through a lot with the family Mm -hmm. took me eight years to bring that uh, to bring the the relationship back it took a lot of time and uh, mm-hmm. of course it was from my own side trying always to go back to them and talk to them because the family my mom wouldn't talk to me she would bike at me she would just say the most hurtful thing that you would ever hear about uh, about me converting to islam about islam itself and all these things but alhamdulillah you know uh finally i got to the to the point is like i got convinced by the quran i just need like this little jump you know it's like little push you know just to go and say that shahada and uh finally i um, i read chapter 5 verse 81 where uh, god says in the quran that the the 
um, the most enemy to the believers are the ones uh, that the Jews and uh, the Jews and the closest people to the to the believers are the ones who call themselves Christians. That because they have uh, uh, priests and and um, priests and um, and pastors that they are not arrogant. And at that time, my father died like two years before, and he was a pastor for four. He was a church planter for four churches in Jordan. And that just like hit me because I remembered my father, how he was not arrogant. He was very humble. He loved to um, to give people. He was very generous and all that. And then I was like, yeah, that's true. They are very close to the Muslims. And uh, it's and then the next verse says that if they heard uh, what has revealed to them, you will see that their eyes will tear. And they start crying and saying, oh, Lord, we have believed. So write us among the witnesses. And I just like, I just put the, I was like, oh, this is it. You know, I believe. And oh, Lord, just strike me among the witnesses. And I remember I was actually reading this in the computer lab in, in my college. And I just left everything. And I talked to my friends and I was like, oh, please, I want to come and talk to you. It's very important. And I was crying at that time. And uh, I left the, the computer lab and I was driving in my car and, and I, I was like telling God, I was like, oh, Allah. By the way, the Christian Arab, they call God Allah also. So I was like, oh, Allah, if this is the right thing, then make it easy for me. If it is not the right thing, then let me just have a, a, a car accident or something. I don't want to go to hellfire. I want to go to the right place. And uh, subhanAllah, Allah made it easy. And I went to those friends and I said, hey, I want to become a Muslim. And one of them just looked at me and he started laughing and he was like, you're kidding, right? And I said, no, I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm serious. And I said, well, last time I saw you like two, three months and you were telling me that even if you said the Shahada and you don't believe in them, in it, that doesn't make you a Muslim. And I said, no, I do believe. And I told him, told them about my story, how I read the Quran and everything. And they start crying and they say, oh, Allah loves you. And I was like, why? And he said, well, tomorrow is the first day of Ramadan. And so I don't have to only learn how to pray, but now I have to fast. <laughs> I have to fast too, right? Oh. It was all at once, <laughs> you know. And then, uh, like, uh, I hid my Islam for about two weeks. But uh, it wasn't for long, for like after two weeks when they figured out that I'm a Muslim, I was uh, literally abused. Uh, my brother hit me, he choked me to death. Uh, my mom uh, was slapping me left and right. And uh, I, I, I left the house bleeding. I mean, I was like, you know, literally with 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 a dark eye, with like blue eye. And, uh, you know, I was, I was really in a bad shape. And uh, the police came, and it was like really a, a, a traumatic, traumatic uh, experience. It was like a, a drama story. <laughs> but subhanAllah, I left the house, tried to come back multiple times, but it didn't work out. I um, Then after five years, after I got uh, divorced, uh, I married a Muslim, and then I got a divorce after this. Um, it kind of like hit me really hard. I went down to Jordan and it was the worst experience ever and um, um, I don't want to talk a little bit more about it but uh, you know long story short um, my downside that I left Islam I left Islam for a very short time for about 11 months but then I came back again but this time I came back stronger than before Alhamdulillah and Allah guided me to this to this to the true path and I learned Islam in a whole different way. And uh, not only that, um, I get to help those women that they also go through what I went through, through like bad divorces, uh, bad marriages, uh, those women that they uh, have cultural shock with the Muslims, those Muslims, those women that they are really in on the edge of depression and uh, committing suicide because of the changes that happen to them and the bad experience that they have. And I can't blame Islam for it. I can't blame people. 
that they sometimes cause all that trauma and depress, mm -hmm. depression, right? And so Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, you know, Allah uh, put me in that path and in this journey for a, for a reason, is to help those people that they are in, in need and that they are desperate and that they have all these um, kind of uh, problems. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me and you to be, um, uh, to be beneficial for the community, not only for the Muslims, but also for the non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and to be uh, to be good citizens as well. You know, uh, you know, as Muslim Americans, that they were proud to be here, and uh, and and we would love to help any anybody that uh, they need support or help. Inshallah. Mm -hmm. well, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry that you had such a hard time with your family and that you went through such hardship, but you said you are reconnected with your family now, right? That's right, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Now, my mom is a very good friend of mine. I have a brother that he lives with me right now. I'm, a di I'm divorced again, <laughs> alhamdulillah. But I'm happily divorced. Uh, it's not like the first time. And uh, I feel that I can do more things uh, with myself uh, as a divorced person. And, uh, you know, I can help those women that they are in the same situation like me. And at the same time, I can focus more on things than focusing on a husband like my studies. I would love to go back to my uh, school and finish my degree. I have a degree in Islamic studies mm -hmm. and I have also a degree in computer. So I do also 3D modeling and animation for wow. games. Nice. Yeah, that's my uh, my professional job. Uh, but also I would love to go for master degree for my graduate and uh, get my degree probably in religion or in like being a chaplain or something like that. Um, yeah, and so also I can focus more on my brothers and my mom in my relationship, uh, trying to recover from all the broken things that we had before, the things that we did to each other, right? Uh, but um, I think this is a good time to reconnect and uh, like to, you know, to reform that relationship to something different and something better. And at the same time, also, it's a, it's time for me to get closer to Allah, you know, and learn more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So mm. uh, at the end, you know, before we wrap up, what uh, what message do you, would you like to give to non-Muslims uh, first and then to the Muslims around you, inshallah? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, for, I guess, non-Muslims, the message that I would love to send out is that there's no need for hate or, you know, fear or any of that. You know, Muslim people are very warm hearted, very accepting, very religious, usually. Um, and I guess I would just like to spread the message about that. I would like to have communities really understand that they don't need to be afraid because we're wearing a headscarf right. or a niqab. Yeah. We're just women or we're just, you know, the Muslim men, just members of the community, good members of the community. Right. Muslim people normally don't drink or do drugs or smoke or use profanity. And so I think there's a lot of stigma, um, mostly caused by media, um, that really kind of concerns me right now. So really, I guess my biggest message is I'd like for people to just get a better understanding of what Islam is and who Muslims are in their community. Nice. And uh, what was the other group that you asked me about? That was, uh, that's really nice. Uh, what about uh, the Muslims? What message would you give to the Muslims here in the West? Oh, okay. Uh, for the Muslims, I would wish, <laughs> inshallah, uh, that there would be more awareness about the needs of new Muslims and that more Muslims would be willing to maybe reach out and offer some community, some companionship, uh, you know, to people who are just stepping into the faith and who are going through sometimes very hard times 
uh, for example, what you went through, that was much more extreme than what I've been through. And I felt the pain myself without any of the physical abuse and without, so you know, funny. Yeah, it's so funny that I went to the masjid over here in Richardson, Texas, and I sent two messages and I even wrote a letter to that mosque telling them that uh, when I got kicked out from the house and I didn't have any place to stay uh, the first time when I became Muslim, uh, no one answered. No one picked up the phone and, and talked to me about it when I really needed help. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sad, you know. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can relate to that because I had um, somewhat similar experience when I wanted to find out more about becoming Muslim. I had a very hard time connecting with anyone at the mosque. And when I finally decided to go on my own, which I did, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Very brave. I still say that very brave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, later, a few months later, when I decided I wanted to do Shahada, I once again ran into the same problem where I was not able to have my phone calls answered or have that just anybody to help me do Shahada because I didn't know how else to do it. I was reaching out trying to, to do that. And after almost two weeks, again, I uh, ended up doing it online because I was searching out how can I do shahada? I don't want to wait. So maybe that's another thing that Muslims can be more aware of that um, maybe when a new Muslim calls or someone that's interested in Islam, maybe be more, um, I guess, aware of the importance that it is to them to even just make that phone call back and say, hello, we received your message. Um, and maybe even just head them in another direction if you don't have time to, right. you know, help. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. That's like two hours already. Oh, thank you. Time goes fast. An hour, actually, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, that's great. It's a great interview, and I really appreciate all your time. Inshallah, send me your um, your links that you want to put in the video so I can put them okay. also. Yeah, and I'll put yours in too. So send me your links. Thank you so much. And, uh, to my viewers, um, in the description below, I'll also have some links. So if you'd like to visit with Ruba at any of her sites, the links will be down below. And thank you for coming and joining with us today. Me too. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Oh, you too. Assalamu so alaikum. Peace be upon you. Peace be upon you. <laughs> All right. We can.